and his blessings of this lectureship is the opportunity to see old friends. And I just five minutes ago, I was struck by the sight of Cliff Sabro and Wesley Walker sitting in the same pew together because I, re I just flashed back to 20 years ago when we were all in the same classroom and they used to sit next to each other in the, in the back row of the class. And to think about how much time has gone by, but also how much of the Lord's work these two men have done, they, they're excellent. And our speaker this hour is Wesley Walker. Wesley is a good friend of mine. I enjoy our text messaging. We don't get a chance to see each other very often, but when we do, it's always a good opportunity to say hello and catch up a little bit. Uh, we keep up with each other through text messaging and that kind of thing. Uh, but Wesley is a tremendous student of God's word. He is obviously a Bear Valley graduate. He's also a graduate of Freed Hardman University where he got his MDiv in biblical languages. But more than that, he's a strong family man. It's a good Christian example. And he's an excellent preacher and you're about to be blessed. So. Wesley, come preach the word. Mike is kind not to uh, share the stories from 17 to 20 years ago when I was a student here at Bear Valley and Cliff and I were in class together. That was days before text messaging was free. It cost five cents to text. And so Cliff and I wanted to communicate in class uh, as strategically as possible, and there wasn't quite the Wi-Fi to do instant messaging downstairs. So one day, we ran a wire connecting our computers wirely with a wire from one part of the class so we could message back and forth throughout the day. It was surprisingly, no teachers ever picked up on the fact there was a wire running to the floor from one computer to the other as we were able to message back and forth. I will iterate what Mike said. It's always good to be at Bear Valley, not just to have the chance to preach, but the chance to hear those who I've spent some time and energy to prepare lessons to be here, but also to see so many familiar faces. I always know that trip from the airport to the hotel is going to be great, meeting a new student. In this case, someone that I met before previously when I was in Oklahoma, but getting to learn about their excitement about the classes they're taking and the stuff that they're doing. He was even very excited about Denny's Matthew class. I'm not sure he had the final yet or not there, but he was excited about it. Uh, nonetheless, I did not temper his excitement. Uh, you get back to the hotel and you walk in and you see folks that you know are going to be there and you get a chance to put names with faces and reacquaint. And it's always a good time to, to be here and be a part of this. I look forward to this uh, every year and this opportunity uh, and more so as life becomes more hectic and things become busier. It's a great weekend for me to sit back and be blessed. And so I hope to preach to you the word of God today, but you've already blessed me with your presence this morning. And so many of you with your words of encouragement, just seeing your faces is a blessing uh, to be here. And I'm grateful for my years at Bear Valley, not quite 20 years ago, but getting there very, very quickly uh, on the calendar here. Uh, grateful to be a, a part of that there. And also my time at Bear Valley when my dad was here as well. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll be there in just a moment. Back this spring, my family took a trip to uh, Virginia to uh, preach over that way. To Actually, it was a congregation, one of the Bear Valley grads Michael Green works at. And we had a chance to preach over the weekend. It was the same weekend as my kids' spring break. So we decided not just to go and preach, but to go and visit a historical sites in Virginia. If you've been to Virginia or you know much about history, you know that Virginia is full of historical sites. So you have to kind of pick what area or what time in history you're going to focus on. And so we decided we would spend our time in kind of two areas, a couple of presidential houses, uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, and then go down to the area called Colonial Williamsburg, where you can learn about early, early American history, some of the first uh, uh, people to come over and settle America from Britain, some of the first colonies that were set up, and some of the trials and tribulations that you had as a part of them. And throughout our touring of those places, whether we paid for a tour, just walked around seeing the signs and reading what took place, one of the words that kept popping up in my mind as we walked around those locations was the word hope. So much of early America was built on the idea of hope. It was those, that hope that had folks sell across country for 
religious freedom, for uh, the chance to make riches, for the chance to have their own land, for the chance uh, to be free. They had hope that they would go to a new world, in their mind, a, a better world. So they risk a pretty terrible journey across that battle to make it to their location. And they would go all the way across these terrible times, make it to a new world with nothing there around them, settle in with those folks that are there, and attempt to make a new life based off simply the hope that they would have a better life than they had in the past. And oftentimes they would go just men coming across to set up encampments and places, hoping for a time in which, they, in which they were able to create a place out of that wilderness that their wives and children could come. And they'd send their wives and children over, hoping to create a society and a family and a place. And they lived their lives in hope. They'd hoped they'd survive a winter, a disease, a time that was coming up. So much was built on hope. As we walked around Colonial Williamsburg and Jamestown and saw the individuals and the places where they first began, you could see individuals who survived harsh conditions because they were hopeful for something better. Then we checked up further the homes of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and saw the way that hope filled their lives. They were a hopeful people. They could create a world in which there was not a monarchy ruling over the American empire, but rather we would have a group in which we could be as citizens, as kings, as Thomas Jefferson's vision was, being able to be your own autonomous person, reuniting with those around you to create a republic in which you're able to make decisions based off rational thought and not have to worry about who might be the next king who's born and what rules and regulations they might bring. They had a hope of freedom that they thought they did not have currently in America. The hope led them to write things like the Declaration of Independence to be sent to King George and say, we are breaking off ties with you completely knowing that could cost them everything. They knew it could mean a war. It could mean a disaster. It could mean them being tried and hung for treason. It could mean all their wealth being taken away, but they hoped that there would be something better in the end of all of that. You go up to, my, up to Mount Vernon where George Washington is there. There's a display about Washington and his wartime uh, leadership. And there's only one word that kind of keeps Washington going. It's a hope and a perseverance during some of the worst times in our country's history for any military we ever had. Standing there, George Washington in the midst of Valley Forge and other places, knowing his men are ill-equipped, the British have the better battle plan, the the better army, the better things, the the, the more mercenaries, but yet he just hoped that they can make it through the next month, the next year, the next day, and hopefully over time Congress would give them what they needed to fight this war, and over time they'd be able to bring down the British to the point to where the British got tired of the war and would simply leave. They fought with this vision of hope believing it was going to be worth it in the end to not give up and continue the battle. If you read stories about Ukraine and Russia, you can see something similar there with Ukrainian fighters who seem to be at insurmountable odds, but yet they have hope that they can gain victory in all of that. As I walk through Monticello, where the home there of Thomas Jefferson, you're able to see not just the wealth and the mind of one of the greatest thinkers in U.S. history, Thomas Jefferson, but also a man there who could write about all men being created equal and the freedom we all deserve and from his front porch see the slave quarters, where he had numerous individuals who were enslaved by him throughout their lives. And you could walk by those slave quarters and see the places where enslaved men and women lived their lives and where you had their particular life was there and they had no real control over much of what they did. And you'd read stories about an enslaved woman who lost her children because they were sold off from one moment to another. But yet you'd also read stories of hope. In fact, if you go through the history of American museology and or hymnology and see the, the music and the songs that are sung throughout the ages, you go back to some of the spiritual songs that come from the days of slavery, and you'll see hope-filled songs in which those who face brutality and structure in our system were able to sing to a God who they believe would eventually wrong the rights of the world and give them peace either in this world or the world to come, and they battled their day-to-day brutality, believing in hoping in a God who could do more for them in the future than they were getting currently in the world they lived in. They lived their life by hope. There's a book called Chicken Soup for the Jewish Soul, and I'm always worried about quoting books like that as well as preacher stories because they oftentimes uh, are found to be not as truthful as they should be, you'd think, for having those areas. 
But there's a story that I thought quite interesting in which uh, there was a man who told the story of being in Auschwitz. And if you know anything about uh, history in the World War II and Nazi Germany, Auschwitz was a death camp in which 1.1 million plus people died, many of them Jewish men and women. They died because of things like mass murder that you witnessed about or heard about in your history books, but also through just the deprivation that took place in those camps. I've never been to Auschwitz, but I did spend some time in Dachau, which was another Jewish concentration camp, and just seeing the pictures that they have found from those locations that our military men found when they were there, and reading the stories of the experimentation, the lack of provisions, and the way those people lived, you could see the utter brutality of the situation. It was meant not just to kill you, but to completely just devastate you. So the story is told by a man who later became a rabbi, Rabbi Hugo, who says while at Auschwitz, he was there with his family, and they were given very little provisions week in and week out, but Hanukkah came around, and Hanukkah, you light the lights, and his dad used some of their provisions, a good portion, to keep the light lit. And the son asked the question, why would you waste the food that we have, the stuff that we have to make our meals by doing something like this. We could have eaten that or used that or used it to cook our own food or to, to season our own food there. Why did you use it to, uh, to, to light a lamp for a few more days? But the history of Hanukkah is a history of hope. The whole point of the lamp and the lighting it up that you see there is God's provision. And in the history of the story of Judaism, you, you see that taking place there. And the, and the father looked at the son and says, we know that you can live a few weeks or a few days without water and a few weeks without food, but you cannot live without hope. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're visiting somebody who's possibly near the end of their life? One of the things that preachers have the privilege of doing is oftentimes sitting around families in those most difficult times to, to talk with them about the life things they're going through. And sometimes you visit somebody who's fighting a difficult situation. They have all the hope in the world. And you think to yourself, if anybody's going to make it through it, they're going to make it through it. They're going to fight through this no matter what it takes. And sometimes they do. And you had that blessing of somebody who was so filled with hope, they kept doing things and kept trying things. Every now and then you have those devastating visits with someone where you sit down and maybe the news is so bad or the things are so hard, they've, they've given up hope. And there's times I've gone home to my wife, Amanda, and said, I don't think it's going to be many days now before brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so passes. They just seemed at this point to think there's no hope. So without hope, we oftentimes find ourselves in these situations where we think that the life's impossible to live. And without hope, we, we find ourselves where we, we don't want to take that next step forward. And so without hope, it's really impossible to live the life that God wants us to live. Without hope, we cannot have the motivation, the desire, the, the meaning in life to continue to do the things that God wants us to do. We need that hope. And in Hebrews chapter 6, if you turn your Bibles there in just a moment, we'll talk about the hope that God provides and how that hope allows us to live this life that God wants us to live. But I want to talk just for a moment about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is this book that's somewhat unique in our Bibles. It's not a, a letter written down the way Paul would write to a church here or a church there. It's not a, a, a gospel account. We have a biography of Jesus. It is a sermon that was preached and then written down and passed along to Jewish Christians at numerous different congregations throughout the region. It's a word of exhortation, the preacher says, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22. This is a sermon that's being preached based off of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, in which he's saying, let's go back to our Bible and look to Jesus and stay faithful to him. The key verse throughout is actually not a verse in the book of Hebrews, the verse, verse in the book of Psalms, Psalm 110, this great messianic passage the Hebrew writer goes back to over and over and over again to remind them that, that this is the one they've been looking for, that the Son, Jesus, is who they should put their hope in because the underlying problem the preacher sees, the group of folks who, because they don't trust that enough or don't hope in him enough, they're backing away and going to other things. 
So he writes this, well, he preaches this sermon that gets recorded and passed along to encourage them to stay faithful to the Son, the one whom God had promised that you'll be a high priest forever, the one that God had given them to be this usher of a new and better life. God, he had told them to stay faithful to this individual. That's the purpose of this sermon. If you read the book of Hebrews, there are, are two tracks the preacher takes. On the one hand, he has a track of encouragement where he says things like, you can do this, and God has given you a better promise, and God is taking care of you, and God is there to help you, and I think you can do better than your forefathers. You have section after section where he talks about the encouragement that they can have because God is going to be there for you. Back there in Hebrews chapter 6, he used the phrase, but we have better things of you. Believing wholeheartedly this group of Christians will not make the same mistakes their forefathers did and miss out on the great promises of God. That sort of track one throughout the book of Hebrews, these words of encouragement where the preacher is saying, you guys can do this. You don't have to walk away from your hope, Jesus. You don't have to do that at all. And you got kind of track number two. In the book of Hebrews, which presents us with some of the strongest language in Scripture regarding judgment, and specifically not judgment of the world, but judgment of God's people. Where the Hebrew writers warns the people of God of what happens to them if they walk away from the Son, if they walk away from Jesus, here's what's going to happen to you. And you read the book of Hebrews, you find sections that are very, very strong in their language about apostasy and stepping away and the judgment of God. In fact, he loves to use the phrase, how much more if you walk away from Jesus will God punish you than he did those who walked away from the words of Moses? And you can read about the grand punishments you see in the law of Moses for those who did not keep the the words there. How much more will God punish those who walk away from the sun? And you have those phrases like this, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In the context there is Christians, not the world, but Christians who step away from their responsibilities to God, walk away from the faith and go back under the old system. And he says, do you really want to face God doing that? Trampling under a foot the word of God and the son of God and making his blood a common thing. You have that second track where he has these strong warnings. And in Hebrews chapter 6, there in verses 2 and following, you have maybe one of the strongest warning sections in the book. One of those where you read it once and you read it again, you read it a third time and you go look at a commentary and you go ask somebody because you're trying to figure out what exactly does this mean? Thankfully, that's not my section, so I have to tell you what it means. But in Hebrews chapter 6, you have a section there where it talks about if you continue to do these things and walk in this way after you have tasted all the heavenly gifts, then it's impossible for you once again to be renewed back to the faith. It's a stern and strong warning against apostasy in which he says this is what could happen to you. But as often the case, the preacher, as any preacher should, he gives those words of, 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 of trepidation followed by words of encouragement where he says, but I have better thoughts of you. And in our section, he gets into those better thoughts. There in verse 13, we bound to verse 20, the, the heart of our section there, you're going to see this sort of words of encouragement based upon the conversation and promises that God has made to his people. The Hebrew preacher here will take some scriptures from Genesis and and take a reminder from Psalm 110 verse 4 and he'll put those two together and he'll mix those things up and he says when you combine these two things you have a strongest promise you can possibly make that God is going to be with you and that God is on your side and that Jesus is your true and only hope. He goes back to Abraham. Abraham is the beginning of the Christian story. We oftentimes talk about Jesus, but Abraham at least is our beginning because there in Abraham, you've got a promise where God says, I will bless you and through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And there we have the text where God said, uh, the Hebrew preacher says, God made a promise to Abraham to bless all of us. And we know from scripture later on that promise to Abraham to bless us all comes through one man Jesus. 
and that God was working the way through all of your Bibles from the story of Abraham and the children of Israel working his way through terrible Israelite unfaithfulness and terrible kings and rejections of God and having to put them into captivity and bring them back and then Pharisaicism that pulls up after that and over and over again God works through them because God believes he's going to because God has a plan in place to bring about the promise that God would bless his people. So promise number one is here. He says, look, God promises he will bless you. And he tells you he's going to bless you through this seed of Abraham, Jesus himself. But how can you trust God's promise? You know, if I promise you something or if I go to the bank today and say, hey, I'm going to buy a car and I would like to, you to give me the money to loan on that car. I don't want to see the interest rates are today on any loans right now, but let's say that's what you do, and you go up there, they're going to say, great, we're going to need proof that you can pay this back, so show us you have a job, or you have this thing, or that thing. I preach at Woodson Chapel, I also work for a healthcare company, I spend a lot of time in contract negotiations, and in contract negotiations, they want to know, can you put that in language, with the lawyer signs off on it, saying, you will do what you say you're going to do, me just simply saying, don't worry about it, our solution works exactly how I promise, doesn't matter to them, they want to have it in writing, so somebody on our team signs it, and somebody on their team signs it, so something doesn't go right, they can say, you promised this. But how do you have God give a guarantee? God can't promise anything greater than himself. He can't offer up collateral greater than himself. So what the text says here is God, instead of doing something else, God also gives an oath. The oath is probably Psalm 110 verse 4 where the text there tells us that he's making Jesus a high priest forever so that we have this double promise here that Jesus is the anchor of our soul. There in Hebrews chapter 6, we have this anchor of our soul by which our topic comes today. I think he has in mind, it's Jesus himself. He's the, the promise of Abraham, the fulfillment of Psalm 110. This is the anchor of our soul that allows us to live the life that God wants us to live. He's the one that we should put our hope in. Now, here's the truth of the matter. If you put your hope in one thing, you must flee other things that are lesser hopes. And what's happening in the book of Hebrews, they're going back to that old way of life, the, uh, the old things they were doing before, whether it was the, the worship of temples or the sacrifices or this thing or that thing. They're going back to those old hopes over and over again and refusing to cling to Jesus. And before we stop for a moment and maybe overly be critical of our brothers and sisters of the faith back then. It's the same problem we have. Jesus is our hope. He is our anchor. He's the one by which we can have any sort of a future plan or motivation, but yet we look for other hopes as well. You look at me like, what are you talking about, preacher? And I could probably go to some of your social media posts and maybe some of your conversations and point out all kinds of hopes we have. We have hopes that this politician or that politician will save the world. If only we would have voted this way or that way or kept this vote or that vote. And guess what? In the next, when's the next, every, every two days an election. The next few days we'll have another election probably. And somebody's going to vote and they're going to say, I'm the savior. Or that guy's the, the, the devil. And it's going to go back and forth again because we put our hope in things like politics. Or in things like finances, that if I have more money and more things, the stock market's up. If the stock market's down, we go back and forth on those things. We put our hope in that. We put our hope in relationships and so many other things than Jesus. And you step back and you realize that if you're going to put your hope in Jesus, you have to walk away from lesser hopes. Because lesser hopes cannot be anchors to your soul. They're not big enough and they're not strong enough to handle life's ups and downs. So instead, the preacher says, the anchor of your hope, of your soul, is Jesus. He is the anchor of hope that you need. And so why is that? Or how is hope there to, to anchor our soul? What does hope do for us to allow us to live a life that glorifies God? How does hope anchor our soul? The rest of our time, I'm going to give you a few reasons this morning as, you, as we're here together. You know, hope anchors our soul because hope produces endurance. That's the comment he makes there in Hebrews chapter 6 regarding hope. Hope gives us the motivation to keep on going when life gets difficult. We've got a lady at church right now who's going through chemotherapy. 
Not the first time in the history of Woodson Chapel, and sadly not the last time we'll have somebody going through that. And normally, when we have our prayer list, we have numerous folks going through those things. And I point her out because every few days she checks in with a blog post in which she sort of walks through her journey that she's going through, all the the things she's had to do, the complications. But every one of them is hope-filled. At the very end, she mentions but I only have this many more left, or this is the day this is all over. This is the day I'm going to get that cancer-free diagnosis. She lives by hope, and you kind of have to. If you think about cancer and what it does, you, you cut something off, you take out this part, you put poison in your body, doing all these things to destroy it with the hope of, in the end, it's going to be better for you. And the only way you endure the things that go along with things like chemotherapy because you believe that in the end, you're going to make it through it. It produces endurance to keep on going. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about faithfulness to the end. The goal is not to be faithful for a short time, for a day or two, but be faithful until Until Jesus returns. And so we've got to have a hope that lets us endure all of life's ups and downs. Emmett, who you all know pretty well, he was with me a couple of years ago. I wish he would have came this year, but uh, his schedule doesn't work. It's always funny thinking about a six-year-old schedule. But if you've got kids, you know everybody has a schedule uh, right now. And he had some baseball games he didn't want to miss. And I'm excited he wants to play Especially since uh, when he was born, I didn't know I'd have days like this, so we didn't want him to miss that, and we made it all work out. But Emmett, every morning, has to get up and do treatments, every night has to do treatments, and there are days you can imagine a six-year-old says, I just want to go back to sleep, or I just want to play games, or I want to do this. But his mom and I make tough choices to have him keep on doing it because we have the hope that by doing that, he'll continue to live a very normal life far, far into the future. Or when he was first diagnosed, we went to a doctor. The doctor there talked to us about future medications. Every time one comes out that's better than the last and Emmett gets to be on it, we give it to him. We think there's another dose of hope to keep doing this, to keep prolonging these things, uh, to keep helping him in some way because hope produces endurance. In the life of these early Christians, they needed endurance because persecution was real. They were losing, it says, not yet the loss of life. They were losing property. They were losing prestige. It was a real thing. They needed to endure and stay faithful to Jesus, and maybe we'll need to do that as well. We're not really built right now to be people who endure very well. We're folks who have pretty easy lives, and even the slightest inconvenience or the slightest turn of society away from God gets us up in arms as if we've been persecuted like they were in the Colosseum days. Imagine real persecution happening. Imagine things happening that are not just minor things but big things. Will we endure those areas? We had the last couple of years with the COVID things going on. We had folks who had to figure out what they're going to do in terms of worship, not worship. And then they got lives of convenience. And now all of a sudden churches have come back and and they're seeing similar things when I speak across the country. They're having a tough time with certain groups attending again. And they're wondering what the future looks like. And we've had churches that have shut doors and had to reduce mission budgets and those sort of things because they struggled through this and because they couldn't make it and they couldn't have the hope to handle any sort of inconveniences there. They didn't have the ability to endure. See, hope gives us the ability to endure, to face the challenges of life and say, I'm going to keep on going because my hope is in Jesus and he will not fail me. Now, I've never been in a storm. I'm not somebody who's like, I'm going to go fish so bad, I'll sit in the middle of a storm to fish. Like, if I see that it's going to rain, we're going back to the shore uh, because, um, you know, that catfish is not worth me dying. As good as catfish is fried, I'd rather just go to the store down the street, buy it, and fry it up than, you know, somebody having to rescue me later because I stayed out there. But I was one time in a pontoon boat with my granddad, and he had the pontoon boat docked on the side of the... uh, of his little cove there. He had a, a little spot at the lake, and the pontoon boat was docked on the cove. And also beside it was docked a little sort of like kid boat. There's a smaller boat there. And uh, my job, or my brother's job, depending on who you ask, was to tie up the little boat to the pontoon boat. And uh, one of us didn't. And so all of a sudden, we get out the next morning, and the pontoon boat is beautifully there, and the little boat is not there any longer. It wasn't anchored. It wasn't tied up, and it wasn't there. When it comes to life, you don't have an anchor of hope. And things get tough and the waves come in and the tide goes out. You find yourself pretty far away from God. 
Because hope gives endurance. And one of the biggest ways hope gives endurance is this. Hope is the antidote to the fear of death. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 2 is one of those passages I would suggest you just sort of read through because it's a pretty profound argument by the preacher here with regards to death and the human experience and how death he describes as not just the idea of the ending of your life, but a perpetual moment in time from the moment you're born in which you find yourself enslaved to the fact that you are going to die. Think about how many folks get that reality and how it causes things like bend life crises and difficulties in life. When you have kids, they remind you you're going to die. Um, Emmett, one day, he was like four, and he said, Dad, when you're fully dead, the person's like, fully dead? Like, is this a plan here? Can I have all your stuff? And I was like, son, when I'm fully dead, I guess you can have my stuff, but let's hope that's a little further down the line than today. But you're reminded of that. Or Emmett sometimes will talk about, and it's, it's fun, I think because of his way, he'll talk about how so you and mom will die first. I'm like, most likely, that's, where, you know, that's the goal here. I don't know the goal, but that's what's going to happen. Yes, well, well, okay, just keep trying to figure it out in his head there. So you learn that death's there. And the older you get, the closer those numbers, they say end of life, get to you. And you think, that's not that far away anymore. You know, back when I was 17 here and at Bear Valley, uh, Mike Height seemed ancient. Now that I'm 37, my kite still seems ancient, but not as ancient as he was when I was here originally. You know, that number 40 that's creeping up on me was like, oh, that's, that's an old age. Now I'm like, no, 40 is the new 20 or whatever, you know, they're trying to sell me on some magazine somewhere. Because life picks up and we all live in this fear of death. But the Hebrew preacher says this is a slavery to us. That oftentimes leads us to do things we otherwise wouldn't do because we're worried about maybe missing out on life. There was a, a phrase that's probably not cool anymore because I know the phrase now. So once I learn the phrase, it's not cool. But that YOLO time, right? It's like, we got a YOLO. You live life once. Do what you want to do. And then you have all those things that go along with that. In fact, I read an article. It was like the YOLO life failure. And this, this couple was like 25. They sold everything they had. And they went and bought a... Um, you know, one of those boats with a sail. I'm it's not a sailboat, it's like a fancier name. I call them sailboats or like catamarans or something famous up in those areas. They went and bought this, and then they went out to spend their life on the boat. They got in the Gulf of Mexico, made it about four hours, and the boat sank to the bottom of the ocean. And they came back so mad. They said, we can't believe it. We, we gave our life savings up. This is our chance to just live this life we have. And, and someone asked them, what kind of experience do you have on a boat? And both of them said, well, we don't have any experience. We just sort of thought you got out there and you put the cell up and there you went. Sometimes YOLO decisions make life a disaster. So sometimes the fear of death leads us to do things we otherwise wouldn't do because we think this is the only life we have to live. But in Hebrews chapter 2, we're told that Jesus put on flesh and he died and was raised for the purpose of conquering death. There's a lot of things that Jesus did in the resurrection. We, we hang on to all of those things. And in the resurrection, he's declared the true king of God. We see the, the kingdom of God come in this new and greater power. We see in the, the resurrection this, this point in which we're justified by God. There's so many things that the death and resurrection of Jesus does. And one of those things is it takes away the fear of death. Because, it is the Hebrew writer's phrase, if our older brother Jesus could die and be raised from the dead, and he's just the beginning of what God can do, that each one of us who die don't stay dead. We're going to be raised as well. So what should we fear of death? As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, quoting, I think, probably an ancient sort of phrase there, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? It's not there anymore, Paul says, because Jesus conquered death. Now imagine living a life in which you did not fear dying. And may I take it a step further? If you don't have to fear dying, what do you have to fear? I find sometimes my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I find myself, are overly afraid. Well, what's going to happen two years from now? What's going to happen four years from now? What's going to happen to our country in 10 years or 15 years? What's going to happen in this place or that place? What kind of world are we leaving our children? And we live our lives of fear and sometimes we scare the kids like we're so fearful that they're like we're all gonna die 
In fact, the other day I was listening to something on the radio, and it was one of those just kind of like nonsense shows, and I'm just kind of having it on, I'm driving, and Preston's in the car, and we get, we get in the car, and I park it, she goes, so does that mean Russia's going to throw a nuclear bomb on us? And I was like, whoa, what, what are you talking about? She's like, well, the radio station said they had, I'm like, ah, i got to watch what I'm listening to, because she was just soaking it in, it's like, this is going to happen at any moment now, and she was so afraid, but it happens to us as well. We get so afraid of what might happen, and we let that fear keep us from serving God. But the thing is, if we don't have to fear death, what do you have to fear? If God's taken away the last and greatest enemy of humanity, and we'll take that away at our resurrection, then why do we live our lives fearful of lesser things? See, hope produces that endurance. Hope produces the antidote of fear, so I don't have to worry about death. I can live my life the way Paul does. If I die, well, I get to be with the Lord. If I live, I get to serve the Lord. If I set myself in prison, I'll serve him there because they can't do anything to me. Or like those early Christians who would go to all sorts of death events. And they would say things like, he's been faithful to me, so I'll be faithful to him. And they died because they believed wholeheartedly in a resurrection. And so they didn't have to fear death anymore. And if you don't have to fear death, you don't have to fear anything else because there's no greater fear than death. And so coming along here, we're reminded of the fact that hope gives me the possibility to live a life unafraid and to live the life that God wants me to live despite what might be happening around me in the world. But more than that, hope motivates me to live by faith. There was a phrase that became popular the last couple of years, and I thought might have been misused at certain, certain times, but it was faith over fear. You guys ever see that? And I thought at times it was like not the best phrase how it was being used. Other times it was a good reminder to the fact that, yes, we have to eventually choose to trust in God over overcoming our fears. When you get to the book of Hebrews, you eventually get to chapter 11, right, where you have those uh, who are going to serve God, live by faith. And in chapter 11, he gives a definition of faith that concludes the idea of hope, where he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Now, that's a weird phrase. And in fact, when you read that, you kind of scratch your head. What does he mean here? I think the simplified is this. Faith is living as if you believe the promises of God are true. Now, ultimately, that's what hope is, that you're so convinced that God's going to do what he says he's going to do, that it changes the way you live today, that you're so convinced of a future world where God makes all the rights wrong, that you say, I'm going to live right now knowing God will make this right in the end. That's what hope looks like. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have those who are motivated by faith, but that faith is tied with the idea of hope, that they have the faith because they trust and they hope in the promises of God. And look at the life that they lived. If you read through chapter 11, you'll know that the phrase over and over again is by faith. And there's a verb there, right? By faith, somebody did this thing. You know, Noah built and Abraham left and Rahab did what she did in terms of the, the putting out the scarlet light and letting, and, and letting the folks into this way. And you've got those who were sawed in half and did this thing or that thing. And all of them by faith worked in some way to serve God. That faith led them to action in this world, and that faith was motivated by a hope that God would keep his promise. But not just that, their faith was oftentimes faith without getting to see the end result, or without getting to see the full picture. Noah's told to build an ark to see a flood, and you wonder how many floods had Noah ever seen, and what does that even mean? Abraham's told to go leave the land that you live in and go to the place that I will show you. I don't like leaving my house without my battery fully charged on my phone so my GPS doesn't go out because I don't know where I'm going. I went to a city I've been to probably 10 times last week for a tournament for my daughter, and I get there and I think, how did I get here? Like the GPS took me left and right and this way. I'm like, I don't know how I got here. I thought I went the wrong way, but I show up and I'm at the ballpark because I'm so used to that. I'm used to knowing exactly where I'm going. That's what I want to have. But by faith, Abraham's told, get up and go and I'll show you when you get there. What does Abraham do? He gets up and goes and does what God tells him to do by faith. He does that. Rahab's told, hide these men 
Tell the folks you haven't seen them. Put out a little thing outside your window and you're not going to be destroyed and God's going to welcome you into his new people. That's a lot of faith there. But she does it. Because by faith we do things we cannot see, trusting that God will make things work out. If you're a Christian, every day of your life, I hope you're living a life by faith in which you are doing things that seem so strange to the world around you because they don't recognize you believe in a different future than they do. And so things like being sacrificial in your giving or giving up your weekends and your time on Sunday or teaching your kids to model certain areas of life, or teaching kindness and forgiveness, and being individuals who are loving and caring and reaching out to outcasts. Those are things the world looks at and says, well, why would you do that? What can they do for you? And you say, they can't do anything for me. But God has told me to. And so if God has asked me to do this, I trust he's going to reward me in the end for this. And so by faith, we live this life in which we are willing to go out and are motivated to live by faith. And that's all because we have hope that God will keep his promise. My favorite verse in chapter 11, though, and I think the key verse is actually not all the by faith section, but the very end of the punchline when the preacher gets to his point, we can see him building up his audience by faith Abraham and by faith Rahab and by faith Noah and by faith this person was sawed in house and this person was thrown in a pit and this person did this. The church is saying, yes, look at all those great members of faith. And he stops and says, and all of them did all of that and they had crummy promises compared to you. So what are you doing by faith? What is the hope motivating you to live by faith right now? What are you doing that's that way? Because the promises that God has given you that you hope in are far greater than the promises they were able to receive. And so we should be even more motivated to live by faith than they were. And if you need to learn how to live by faith, the final point is this. It leads us to imitate faith-filled people. Chapter 12, the cloud of witnesses is in reference to chapter 11, all of those who've run that race before us, they should motivate us. In chapter 13, he speaks of those who taught you the word of God, who who have led you, who do those things. Follow in their footsteps, he says. Follow their lead, submit to their walk in life, and follow them as well. Earlier, he talks about following Jesus in the footsteps that he did as your older brother and trailblazer to God. Do those things and follow those faith-filled people. And hope motivates us to do that. Because we hope in the same God they did. I preached at Woodson Chapel for 13 years now. They took a chance. Looking back, I didn't think it was a chance. Looking back, I thought I was the obvious choice. They took a chance on a 22-year-old. And then a 25-year-old is a preaching man there. And through those years, I've looked and seen pews become empty. Because if you're someplace that long, folks die. And if you're a congregation that's been around for 130 years, folks have their pew. So they're sitting there, and you realize they're gone. But when I preach, I can still see that. Periodically, I'll mention somebody, and I'll point, and everybody knows, oh, that's where Sister So-and-So sat. And they'll remember her life of faith. And I might illustrate, this was Sister Armina, where she sat. Sister Armina was an elder's wife whose husband died, but she continued to serve, not as an elder's wife, but in the same idea of hospitality. Everybody knew you got to go to Sister Armina's home when you became a member of Woodson Chapel. And she had certain games she would play and certain things she would do, and she would greet you, and she was there for all the times to, to put stuff out for any baby that needed it and stuff like that. And by faith, that's how she lived her older years. And you were able to see that life and be motivated by it. Or you look out across the room and you saw a man who was one of the individuals who started several pretty big things in the church. I didn't know that until he passed away. He was 90 years old and I knew him when he was 80 to 90. He did a lot of great work at Woodson Chapel. He taught our fourth graders. I got to know his family and said, no, no, no. When he was back in Texas, they started this work. And when he came here, he was one of the founding members of this thing. I thought, well, we're involved in those things. I had no idea the work he was doing because he didn't want recognition. But by faith, he did those, and those people inspire me because they had hope that their work would be recognized by God, and so do I. You know, we live our life, hopefully, with hope as an anchor. 
And not the hope that this thing will happen or that thing will happen, but the hope in the anchor of Jesus himself. Not the fleeting hopes of this world, like you know, I'm in the middle of a contract negotiation. I hope next Monday when I go back to uh, my computer, I get an email saying we agree with everything and we can sign this. That's, that's headache off of my plate for a while. But that's not a true hope because they might say we don't like anything. You send us, try again. But true hope that Jesus gives us is the fact that we have somebody we can anchor our life on. That when life gets tough, and it will get tough, you can have a source of endurance to overcome. And whenever you want to be fearful of things, you can remember the fact that Jesus conquered the greatest fear, death itself, and destroyed it not just for himself, but for all of his brothers and sisters, the text says. And you can remember the fact that by faith should lead, or that hope should lead us to be those who by faith live this life because we trust and hope in God's promises and we follow the example of those who've gone before us in the last few years and in the last few thousand years. Hope is the anchor for the soul. And I can't tell you what the next few days, years, months will look like, decades. I don't know what my kids will do 20 years from now. But I want to instill them the same hope that I have. So that when they face life's challenges, they do so with an anchor that can help them face anything strongly. And I hope when we face life's challenges, we do so with Jesus, our hope, firmly anchoring our life to him.